Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Juan Celadon, who holds the Niels K. Jern Professorship of Pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh, where he is the Division Chief of Pulmonary Medicine at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Dr. Celadon received his medical degree from the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana School of Medicine in Colombia, his doctorate in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. He completed internal medicine residency at Mount Sinai, and as Arthur mentioned, his fellowship here at Brown, and then went on to advanced research fellowships at Brigham and Women's Hospital. A very talented academician, researcher, and clinician, Dr. Celadon has served as past president of the American Thoracic Society, is a principal investigator of several NIH grants, including a recently awarded NIH T32 in pulmonary medicine. One, please. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, truly a pleasure to, to be back here. So I was a fellow at Raleigh Hospital, as was mentioned, in the 1990s. It was the month of March, and I was working with Nick Hill, uh, who's my attendee. He's now at talk, And we were being hammered. You know, I had like 10 to 12 consults per day. It's my last week. It's a Wednesday. And there was a plaque in the pulmonary division with the fellow who had done the most consults. And I was 10 consults short. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to get this, you know, uh, 10, 12. Of course, the volume went down, and I missed the record by one. And uh, that, my friends, is the only regret I have about my three years here, which were absolutely wonderful. I only have profound gratitude for the caliber of people who I work with, like Dr. Sharon Rams, who's in the audience. So with that, uh, what I will talk to you about today is violence, psychosocial stress, and asthma, which is one of my areas of interest. I have received research materials from Merrick in Hill Steroids to provide medications free of cost to participants in NIH-funded studies. I have no other uh, COIs. So why asthma? Asthma affects over 300 million people around the world, 25 million people in the U.S. alone, 6 million children, 19 million adults. It's by far the most common chronic disease in childhood in the U.S. and worldwide. And it's a disease that imposes enormous uh, cost to the healthcare system. A few years back, estimated as $81 billion per year. It's a disease that is characterized by airway inflammation, airway hyperactivity to a stimuli that are nonspecific, and airflow obstruction that is often but not always reversible. It is not an equal opportunity disease. Uh, in the U.S., asthma affects the poor, more than the well-off, and it varies by race or ethnicity. So this is the prevalence of childhood asthma from 2001 to 2010. And if you look at this graph, you will uh, figure out that um, blacks have the most asthma in the U.S., and Hispanics, not so much, you know, even less than white. But that is a fallacy created by the U.S. Census. If you go to Latin America and you use the term Hispanic, nobody will know what you're talking about. The U.S. Census coined this term to denote anybody whose ancestry can be traced to lands previously under Spanish control. Spanish, uh, Hispanic is an ethnicity and not a race. Hispanics can be of any race. So here you have five people who would have to check the box Hispanic if uh, interviewed by the U.S. Census. They include Rigoberta Menchu on the top left, a Mayan from Guatemala who received the Nobel uh, Prize for Peace a few years back. You have two players from the Red Sox, Mike Lowell, who's a Puerto Rican of Cuban uh, descent, and then David Papi Ortiz, who was recently inducted into the Hall of Fame, who's an Afro-Dominican. Alberto Fujimori, former president of Peru, is Peruvian. His parents were Japanese, but he's also Hispanic. And then finally, my comadre Shakira, who's from my hometown of Barranquilla, Colombia, is half Lebanese, half Colombian. She's also Hispanic. 
from a biomedical research viewpoint, grouping all these people together makes absolutely no sense. Oops, this is not a dancing. So once you divide Hispanics into subgroups, you'll see major differences. For asthma, Puerto Ricans have the highest prevalence morbidity and mortality from asthma of all ethnic groups in the US. Mexicans have the lowest burden from asthma. This is known as the Hispanic paradox. You observe this phenomenon for other diseases such as COPD and prematurity. The state or territory with the, few, with the most premature birth in this country is the island of Puerto Rico. Mexican women deliver the fewest premies in the nation. You do not see this phenomenon for conditions such as obesity and diabetes, for which both groups are heavily affected. I'm having trouble advancing the slides. Oh, here it is. Okay. So why do you see these disparities in asthma and many other uh, respiratory diseases? It's obviously multifactorial. This is a figure from an editorial we wrote for the Blue Journal a few years back. And there are factors at the individual level and at the community level. Of all these factors, the only one that you cannot modify, at least yet, is genetics. But everything else is potentially modifiable, including socioeconomic status, indoor and outdoor pollutant, uh, cigarette smoking, diet, exposure to violence and stress, which is what I will talk about today, access and delivery of healthcare, literacy and cultural beliefs at the individual level, and at the community level, you have some of the same things. You can add housing conditions, uh, education, again, exposure to, to violence and stress, outdoor pollution, and so forth. And in a given patient, many of these things are operational or are affecting the risk and severity of asthma. So why exposure to violence? Over the last two decades, our group and others have shown a link between exposure to violence and related distress and the inception of asthma, particularly in children, and also a severity of asthma. So exposure to violence, where it's at the individual level, pre or postnatal, uh, individually or in the family, uh, in the, at the community level, or after a war or a natural disaster like a hurricane, and there are several of them going on, Fiona in Florida, uh, Fiona in Puerto Rico, and Ian in Florida. Patients get stressed from this, and that can, and uh, there's a growing body of evidence showing that somebody who was previously, health, previously healthy can develop asthma, and patients who already have asthma get worse. So I told you about the burden of asthma in Puerto Ricans, but the other thing about Puerto Ricans is they appear to be particularly susceptible to the detrimental effects of violence and natural catastrophes. So following the Vietnam War, the group of veterans who reported the most PTSD symptoms were Puerto Ricans. Following the events of 9-11-2001 in the city of New York, the ethnic group that reported the most PTSD symptoms were Puerto Ricans. We and others, as I said, have linked uh, violence and stress to asthma and morbidity from asthma. So I'm going to first speak about child maltreatment. Now, you know, uh, Puerto Rico has been subjected to a series of catastrophes. Uh, I remind you that 40% of your fellow citizens do not know that Puerto Rico is part of the U.S. Uh, to this point, right? But they had Hurricane Maria in 2017, earthquakes, COVID, and now Hurricane Fiona. But it's the beautiful fort of El Moro in San Juan. So in the first of these studies, we examined the relationship between child maltreatment in asthma and asthma morbidity in a group of 1,200 uh, children and adolescents in the metropolitan area of San Juan. In the year prior to the study, 14% of these children had witnessed an act of, act of violence, 7% had been direct victims of violence, and 6% had experienced physical or sexual abuse. And in this first study, we showed an association between uh, physical or sexual abuse in the year prior to the study and the risk of asthma, medication used for asthma, visits to the ED hospitalizations, despite accounting for indicators of socioeconomic status, healthcare, and others. This first study was cross-sectional. It's a snapshot. 
So you cannot exclude a phenomenon called reverse causation. You can argue with me that perhaps these kids are sicker and therefore more likely to be abused because they stay at home longer. We, at this, in this first study, postulated that perhaps a potential mechanism was alterations in the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And we awaited longitudinal studies. And shortly thereafter, this was uh, confirmed by an independent group. This is a large study of African-American adult women who were followed for about 17 years. Uh, and in this woman, those who had experienced physical or sexual abuse during childhood were more likely to develop new onset asthma during longitudinal follow-up, a paper by Coogan. More recently, with Dr. Yu Ying Han, we took advantage of a major resource called the United Kingdom Biobank, the UK Biobank, which is publicly available. We, we knew that child maltreatment has been linked to major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder in adults. We knew also that major depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder have been associated with asthma in adults and children. So the question we had was, could we show that part of this association between child maltreatment and asthma is mediated by the development of these mental illnesses? So we look at this in a study of 121,000 British adults who were 40 and older and were enrolled in the UK Biobank. So we showed that any type of child maltreatment in these adults uh, was associated with 22% excess odds, odds of asthma. We showed a, a linear uh, relationship, a dose-response relationship. This is the more types of maltreatment these adults reported during childhood, the higher the risk of asthma. But this was different, uh, and this is a mediation analysis where you take your main uh, association, in this case maltreatment and asthma, active asthma in these adults, and then you look at what percent of that could be mediated by these mental disorders. And both of them independently mediated part of the effect. If you took both of them into account, they mediated over a third of the estimated effect of child maltreatment on asthma. So this suggests, again, that MDD and GAD uh, mediate part of, substantially mediate the association. This was true in never smokers, by the way. I didn't show you that. But even if you exclude those who ever smoke, this is still uh, very significant. So the, the message here was that clinicians taking care of adult patients with asthma should be aware, particularly in those who are depressed or have anxiety of the possibility of prior child maltreatment and treat them accordingly. Exposure to violence. So one of the ways environmental or behavioral factors may change biology is through epigenetics. And there are several mechanisms, DNA methylation, histone modification, microRNA. The one that I will be discussing today is DNA methylation, where without changing uh, the sequencing of your DNA, you can alter uh, gene expression by the addition or subtraction of methyl marks in the DNA. So it's the first of a series of papers with Dr. Wei Chen, uh, with this candidate kind of gene called ADCY for short, uh, and asthma in a study of Puerto Rican children. So this gene, which is the gene for the receptor of analyst cyclase activating polypeptide 1 receptor, and I'm going to just go again to call it ADCY, had been implicated in a paper by Ressler and colleagues in the pathogenesis of post-traumatic stress disorder in adults, or PTSD. This was published in Nature in 2011. And then Ressler's group showed that also uh, SNPs in this gene were implicated in anxiety in children. So the question what we had was, could epigenetic or genetic variation in this gene be associated with asthma? Again, this is the figure from Ressler's paper. To my knowledge, this was the first demonstration in the literature that if you use a quantitative scale for PTSD symptoms and you correlate that with methylation, there was a positive uh, relationship. So this is uh, the first table of that paper, second table, where we showed that, in fact, if we use a quantitative scale called exposure to violence scale, the higher uh, the scale, the more methylation of the promoter of this gene. 
And that methylation of the promoter of this gene, in turn, was associated with 30% excess odds of asthma in these um, children and adolescents in Puerto Rico. I didn't show you this, but the same SNP that was associated with PTSD in adults in Ressler's paper was associated with asthma in this Puerto Rican uh, cohort. So to my knowledge, this is the first study to provide a potential genetic or epigenetic basis for the link between stress and asthma. We published this a few years ago. We then, uh, with Dr. Ram Rabnett's sister-in-law, I found out uh, this morning, <laughs> who was one of our fellows, <laughs> We published a paper going further on that and looking at gun violence, which we also have information on, and showing that gun violence, which of course the more extreme form of, of violence, exposure to gun violence in these children was associated with uh, a greater risk of asthma. This is another study. We have access to this very large uh, survey. These are high school students across the US, in which we had information on bullying or victimization. And we showed that both in males and females, those who had experienced victimization in high school had a greater risk of asthma. We also showed, similarly to what we have seen with exposure to violence, that the greater the number of types of violence, and these range from sexual harassment to uh, physical attacks, the higher the risk of asthma. So of course, if you're exposed to violence, you're going to be a stress. And this is now about violence-related stress. So again, this is Dr. Ram Ratna's uh, sister-in-law, <laughs> Sima to the right, and John Brand, who are the first author of this paper. So we also, have, we, we in other groups have shown that Puerto Ricans have lower response to short-acting bronchodilators than members of other racial or ethnic groups. So if you measure BDR, they have lower response than whites or Mexicans. And this was initially attributed to mutations in the gene for the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. However, one of my current collaborators, uh, Dr. Greg Miller at Northwestern, had published a paper in PNAS showing that if you look at uh, gene expression in leukocytes of children and adults with asthma, both acute and chronic stress are associated with lower expression of this gene for the beta-2 energy receptor. So the logical question was, could violence-related distress be associated with lower response to bronchodilator? And in fact, that's what we showed. So on top, you have our cohort. These are Puerto Ricans with asthma age 6 to 14. And we showed that they had a 3.9% lower response. In this age group, 8% would be significant. So this is about 50% of a clinical significant response. Then we went to the Rhode Island Puerto Rico Asthma Center, our collaborators here in Rhode Island, and look at their data. They have whites, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans. And in this cohort in Rhode Island, they had that data on anxiety and panic disorder and anxiety and panic disorder were associated independently or combined with lower response to bronchodilator. Now, the question that you could all ask is, well, sure, they are stressed, their mothers are stressed, or their fathers are stressed, and therefore they are not giving these kids their controller medication. That's why you're finding this. So we went to a third cohort in Enhance, where we found a group of adolescents who had never been diagnosed with asthma. They had never received any medications for asthma, had reported no symptoms, but had a lower FEV1 FBC in a spirometry. And in those kids, a greater report of anxiety was also associated with lower response to bronchodilator. Furthermore, we joined forces with collaborators from around the world. These are multiple studies, including people of many ethnicities in the US and worldwide gather data for over 2,700 uh, youth with asthma, this includes uh, young adults, and th this a SNP in this gene that we had previously studied was associated with a lower response to bronchodilator. It was only 1% genetic effects, however, are very small. Then, this gene is not expressed uh, in white blood cells, but we have data also in children and adults with asthma through another collaboration and we looked to see where the SNP that was associated with reduced response to bronchodilator affected 
entrains, we call this, the expression of ADRB2. And that's what we found. The SNP was associated with lower response to uh, lower uh, expression of ADRB2. Finally, through a collaboration with Ressler and his colleagues, we had data on functional MRIs of the brain of heavily traumatized African-American women, these are adults, in Atlanta, Georgia. And what we found was that those who had the risk SNP allele for a reduced bronchodilator response had increased connectivity of the amygdala and the insula, which is a radiologic biomarker of anxiety. So putting all of this together, we believe that a chronic violence-related distress leads to increased discharge of catecholamines, reduced expression of ADRB2. This is seen with a more uh, strong effect in those who are genetically susceptible. We do not, never postulate this is the only gene implicated in this, but this was a star of proof of concept. Of course, you could uh, think about this a potential mechanism affecting other diseases of the cardiovascular system, for instance. So following up on this, now we have longitudinal data. So these Puerto Rican kids were 6 to 14 in phase 1. We get them back, and they are now 9 to 20. We just submitted a grant to see them when they are 21 to 28, when they are young adults. But nonetheless, here we have data about five years apart in this cohort. And the question that we had now, we have this quantitative scale for violence-related distress at two time points. The question was, if this violence-related distress increases over time, could that affect lung function? In this case, could that affect their asthma control, quality of life, et cetera? We look at that in Puerto Rico, but before that, we'll look at it in another study. It was a clinical trial of vitamin D, multi-center study in the U.S., uh, in which all children received the same dose, age-appropriate uh, dose of inhaled steroids. They were 6 to 16. There was a running period to uh, confirm adherence, confirm that their asthma was well controlled. And we had data on this violence-related distress. So it's a 48-week trial, and compared to the randomization visit at the exit visit, those who had increasing violence-related distress had lower FEB1 and FBC. Again, they were all on low-dose inhaled steroids. They also had a lower asthma-related quality of life, and they, there was a trend also for them to have lower or reduced asthma control. And in the Puerto Rican kids, the results were highly replicated. So five years after the initial visit, those who had increased violence related distress had lower FEV1, had lower FBC, and the effect size was very similar to what we saw in the vitamin D trial. So this suggests that chronic stress related to, to violence associated with decreased lung function, and perhaps one of the mechanisms is reduced sensitivity to steroids, which has been consistently shown in, in human studies of healthy subjects. Those who are highly stressed have reduced sensitivity to steroids. So it's a potential mechanism. So this is one of the ways we're thinking about this story, right? Stress has direct effects and indirect effects that you have to take into account. So indirect effects, we mentioned tobacco use. So all of this analysis, we either adjust for smoking or we analyze the data in never uh, smokers. Uh, you have to take into account overweight and obesity, and in fact, there is some suggestion that obesity may interact with the stress on making asthma worse. And of course, adherence to treatment is something that you also have to consider. I already mentioned that. But of course, there are direct effects. So one of them is potential epigenetic effects and alterations of gene expression in relevant tissues, chronic uh, HPA activation with increased catecholamines, increased cortisol, leading to down-regulation of receptors, the beta-2 energy receptor and glucocorticoid receptors making asthma worse. There are also effects, of course, also effects on immune responses. So I'm going to now go to endotypes. So you uh, have probably seen over the last few years, there has been a revolution in treatment of asthma. In fact, there was a New England Journal paper earlier this year about treatment of T2 high asthma and how T2 high asthma is different from T2 low, and I think you're going to see this in many other diseases, not only respiratory, but in many other systems. 
So we wanted to look at this ETV and maltreatment now in children and adults with high TH2 immunity. So what happens if you restrict this to only people who have uh, enhanced high TH2 immunity? Why do we want to look at this? Well, there are previous studies, a small sample size, the study from Wisconsin, a small uh, group of young adults, showing that acute and chronic stress are associated with biomarkers of TH2 immunity and airway eosinophilia. This study was done in college students during final examination periods. Uh, they measured all these biomarkers. They saw that those who had higher levels of stress had higher airway eosinophilia, uh, IgE, and other markers. We don't know why. One of the largest questions I was, you know, as I was writing this grant. I found this paper from Pat Holt from 1999 in Nature. And what Pat Holt said, this is 23 years ago, is that one of the most important questions in the field of allergen immunology was why is it that if you have kids or adults who are atopic or allergic, some develop asthma while others develop other diseases, allergic rhinitis, eczema, food allergies, eosinophilic esophagitis. What determines target organ specificity among those who have high TH2 immunity? So our hypothesis was that perhaps exposure to violence and related distress during childhood may lead to either new or persistent asthma in youth who have enhanced TH2 immunity. So this just to explain to you a little bit of these uh, Puerto Rican cohorts. The first one is called Pierre Gaul. It was recruited 2009-2010. These are all in the island of Puerto Rico in San Juan. Then phase two was Eva PR. There were 543. They were both selected from a pool of 1,100 uh, eligible households that were randomly selected. 406 of those participated in both studies, and that's the group that we have longitudinal data on. And then we ended up with 391 who had biomarker data in both the studies. The questionnaires on stress and violence can all only be asked of kids who are at least nine. So since the first study, there were some kids who were six, they didn't take the questionnaire. So when you combine everything, we had about 251 uh, with complete data. So the way we define enhanced TH2 immunity, they had to have one or more of three markers, at least one positive IgE to allergens, a total IgE greater or equal 100, and or a eosinophil count that was equal or greater than 150, which is used to determine eligibility for biologics for severe asthma in youth. And so in both these studies, you know, when you look at them cross-sectionally, 81% or more of these kids had at least two positive biomarkers, with some who had three. And this is what we found in a nutshell. So whether we look at exposure to violence, this is the first study, 2009-2010, or we look at violence-related distress, that's called the Checklist of Children's Distress Symptoms for CCDS, both of them were associated with asthma in these kids with high TH2 immunity. Then we look at the second study, and we found the same phenomenon. For every point increment in this scale for exposure to violence, there was a 13% excess odds of the risk of asthma. And for a CCDS score for each point, there was a 54% excess uh, odds. This is the data longitudinally. Again, the sample size here is smaller, but what we found is where you look at ETV or CCDS score, and particularly ETV, those kids who had high exposure to violence scores at or above the median five years apart, these two visits, had higher risk of asthma compared to those who had uh, lower uh, uh, scores. Now, after doing this, we had the idea, so by now you have realized that my career has been very schizophrenic, right? Uh, it confuses a lot of people. So a lot of people say, well, you're a pediatrician. I I'm not a pediatrician. I'm an internist, I'm still certified in internal medicine, pulmonary critical care. But I found out during my years in Boston, if you want to prevent or understand chronic diseases of adulthood, you have to start in the womb. So that's why my, my research spans uh, different age groups. 
And I'm always trying to think about, you know, children and adults, adults, children, everything varies, right? So after doing all of that in these uh, kids, we said, well, you know, could we go back to the UK Biobank, the study of British adults? And it turns out that the UK Biobank has data on eosinophils. They don't have data on IgEs, but they have peripheral blood eosinophil counts. They don't have the same scales of exposure to violence or violence-related stress, but as I showed you earlier, they have data on child maltreatment, right? So the question was, if you restrict your analysis of these British adults to those who have an increased eosinophil count, define in different ways. So we use 150, we use 300, only those British adults. Is there any relationship between child maltreatment and asthma? And the answer is yes. So if you look at British adults, these are 53,000 British adults with an eosinophil count greater or equal 150. And you look at types, the number of types of child maltreatment that they reported. The more types of child maltreatment they reported, the greater the risk of asthma. This is highly significant. It doesn't matter whether you uh, restrict your analysis to never smokers or those who smoke less than 10 pack years. That's the panel on the right. The results are very similar. So in conclusion from this, exposure to violence and child maltreatment are associated with asthma in Puerto Rican youth and in British adults with some biomarkers of high TH2 immunity and likely T2 high asthma. Okay. There are some people who said, well, you would need airway eosinophilia data, sputum eosinophils, you know, pheno, and everything else. But the likelihood that a child, I didn't show you table one of this paper, which is, you know, about to be accepted. But they have very high Ig and eosinophil counts. You know, to say they don't have T2 high asthma, it's, it's a little bit of a stretch. So this supports a link between exposure to violence and maltreatment during childhood a new or persistent asthma among those with, with TH2 immunity. I didn't delve into this, but another important question in the field of asthma is why is it that some children with asthma have their asthma melt away during adolescence while others persist? So these data suggest that this is important also in determining persistence. Finally, uh, I'll show you some data on PTSD. So I, I mentioned that Kerry Ressler, our uh, colleague and collaborator, has done a lot of work on this. So I've been collaborating with Rafael de la Osa at Mount Sinai. Uh, and Rafael is involved in the World Trade Center cohort of rescue and recovery workers. So these were people who, right after 9-11, were involved in this, um, in this type of task. We had data on these rescue and recovery workers. They answer a questionnaire uh, that you can determine probable PTSD, it's a validated scale. Right after 9-11, there was a baseline visit for this cohort. And then they were followed up for four and a half years. And during that time, we'll look at incident or new onset asthma in these workers. There were 3,757 3, such workers who had never smoked and who had never been diagnosed with asthma before 9-11. And this is the summary table uh, for, for this paper. So after taking into account multiple potential confounders, we found that those who had pro PTSD after 9-11 had a higher risk of incident or new onset asthma, 2.4 times higher risk of asthma compared to those who didn't have pro PTSD at baseline. So we showed that. We also showed independently that if you look at bronchodilator responsiveness as a biomarker of asthma uh, in people who, again, had never been diagnosed, PTSD symptoms, uh, PTSD was also associated with that. So again, this was another paper supporting this growing body of evidence linking uh, stress after a catastrophe, exposure to violence, et cetera, and asthma. More recently, uh, Raphael has data that is a smaller subset of 823 workers in whom there are high-resolution CT scans of the chest. So here what we look at was uh, PTSD after 9-11 in relationship to airway wall thickness, which is a marker of airway inflammation, most certainly, or most probably. And what we found is that those who had PTSD also 
have greater airway wall thickness. We don't know whether this is TH2 mediated or not, but it's interesting. So I've also, in parallel with this work, I've also been doing work on genomics. And what we have been doing over the last few years is taking samples from the nasal epithelium of subjects with and without asthma. Why? Because DNA methylation and gene expression in nasal epithelium are highly correlated with those in bronchial epithelium, particularly in non-smokers. And in these studies of youth, we only include non-smokers. We don't have smokers in these forms. So we take nasal epithelial samples, and then we analyze genome-wide DNA methylation and do transcriptomic profiles to look at them in relationship to asthma. As you can also imagine, there is no IRB that would allow you to do 1,000 bronchoscopies, but for those of you who have kids, they don't mind if you pick up their noses. So it's relatively easy to do. So this is a paper that we published three years ago. It's the first large-scale study of DNA methylation in nasal epithelium, atopy, and atopic asthma. And if you do a genome-wide, you look at GWAS data over the last few years, and you look at a Manhattan plot, so on the uh, x-axis are the chromosomes, on the y-axis is uh, statistical significance, the red line, anything above that is significant. So there were thousands of methylation markers that were associated with A to B and atopic asthma, which is very different from what you see in GWAS. And the next question you have to ask, there are two questions. One is, is everything going the direction you expect? And that's a volcano plot on the right side. And the purpose of that is to show that the more methylated a marker was, the lower gene expression and vice versa, which by biology is what you would expect if the marker is, has an effect. But this was the most impressive thing that we found. So on the left-hand side, you have the signal uh, for the Puerto Rico cohort, EVA PR. That was about 483 kids. In the middle, you have data from a cohort of 72 African-American children in Denver, Colorado. So much lower sample size, living in a different geographic region, different ethnicity. And on the extreme right, that's data for Dutch adolescents living in Groningen. So here you have kids across three different ethnicities living in very different areas of the world. We replicated 28 of the top 30 results at a very highly significant level. Very hard to find that for genetics uh, if you look at GWAS results. So the message that this tells me is simple. Most of this is environment. So what matters for disparities is, is not your genetic makeup. It's what you're exposed to. So the level of exposure in these different places would be different. But if the methylation occurs, they are going to affect the risk of asthma. So then what we did was we developed a pile of theory methylation markers and tried to see these, these are cross-sectional studies, the three of them. Can we classify or differentiate youth with atopic asthma from non-atopic controls with some degree of certainty using these methylation markers? And the answer is yes. So we used three different machine learning models. The accuracy in the Puerto Rico cohort was 88%, in the African-American smaller cohort 82%, and in the white or European cohort 87%. To give you some perspective, if you use questionnaire indicators, that will be in the 60% range. If you use genetic markers, the highest you're going to see is about 65%. So this performs better. It, of course, opens a new avenue for research, which you know, we hope, we know now there are many studies around the world looking to see where you can get these nasal epithelial samples, measure some markers, and use them for many different purposes where it is to predict the development of asthma in childhood or persistence uh, after adolescence, where it is to uh, predict response to treatment, prognosis, et cetera. But more recently, we've been trying to put all of these together, right? So take to back to the violence and stress and everything else. So we have all these indicators. We also have this airway epithelial methylation and expression. So this first study was a proof of concept. 
So very, you know, relatively small sample size. We don't have replication cohorts. Why? Because in general, sociologists are allergic to anything that has to do with genetics and vice versa. Geneticists never believe in anything that has to do with sociology. So when you try to find replication cohorts, you find cohorts that have epigenetic data, but nothing on sociology uh, and vice versa. So at this time, we didn't have any replication cohorts, but we were able to find some methylation markers that were associated with different scales measuring stress and bio. And more interestingly for us, as I said, we couldn't find these replication cohorts for the initial analysis of stress in relation to methylation, but we could ask our colleagues where these methylation markers were associated with asthma. It's a different thing, it's not direct replication. And in fact, there were some of these that replicated across three cohorts, one cohort in Holland uh, from Groningen and another cohort from Boston, which is multi-ethnic. And there were some signals that are interesting. Again, there is nothing you know, uh, that meets genome-wide significance, but some of these genes have been previously implicated in asthma and uh, stress-related disorders. One of them is PLCB1, uh, which uh, has been implicated in bronchodilator response and difficult to control asthma during childhood and also affects synaptic uh, plasticity and has been implicated in anxiety-related disorders. Where we are with this now is since we couldn't find a replication course, we created our own. So now <laughs> we have data on this uh, violence and distress in the vitamin D trial and in another study that we just completed called STAR that has uh, Puerto Rican and African-American children. And we now have replicated signals and we're writing a paper that we hope to submit in the next eight to 12 weeks. So uh, I told you already about this ongoing analysis and a paper is in preparation. I think there's some very exciting results there. We also got funded uh, to do a study in Hispanic adults in the Bronx. So this is part of the study of Latinos. There are 16,000 uh, Hispanic adults the Bronx is enriched for Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, so we're recruiting 700 Puerto Rican adults and 200 Dominican adults with and without asthma. We are getting nasalomics data and have, they have funding to follow them for two years. So we're looking at things like lung function decline, severe asthma exacerbations, et cetera, in these Hispanic adults. And of course, you know, uh, no man, Oh, exists in an island or lives alone, and you know this is the product of the work of so many collaborators in the U.S. and, and worldwide, which I've been uh, blessed to work with, including here uh, with Beth McQuaid and others, you know, at this Rhode Island Puerto Rico Asthma Center. And this has been the uh, main sort of motto of my career: the golden rule, right? So when I started uh, doing research, I saw genetic studies mostly included people of European descent, Latinos or Hispanics were largely excluded, and uh, I wanted to make a difference. So everything starts with a dream, and then you, know, you work hard to try to fulfill it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salzon. This is a lovely talk uh, in view. But there's no microphone, so we're going to ask you to repeat the question. Sure. So we... Could you repeat the question? Sure. So the question is where we have IL-13, IL-4, and eotaxin. So we don't have eotaxin, but we're measuring IL-4 and IL-13. And it's highly elevated, you know, in the Puerto Rican kids, right? Which makes sense. I didn't show you this, but they're... I think their geometric mean total IG was like uh, 900. You know, it's, it's pretty high. Uh, it's a very highly atopic cohort, the ones with high TH2 in it. So, uh, the connotation between depression and asthma, deep depression, does asthma get better? That's a trial that if in an oral life I may uh, want to do. <laughs> 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 I just, <laughs> just don't have time. But yeah, that's a clinical trial that is ready to be done because uh, there's very uh, good observational data already. You know, a lot of prospective studies showing that depression predicts the onset asthma in adults. So uh, it's a trial that can be done. Exposure to violence. 
The problem with, you know, so one thing that people, when people ask me this question is, I would start by doing a trial of, an, sorry. So if you have somebody who's been exposed to violence and, you know, you remove them or, you know, interventions that you do, do you see an improvement? So I would I always say that you should first work on treating uh, the things that we know are associated with asthma and have therapy, right? So I wouldn't start with what Marat um, suggested, which is a trial of antidepressants. It would also make sense to do a trial in generalized anxiety disorder because we also can treat with medication. But I found out working with psychologists and psychiatrists is it's really, really hard to do cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, it's hard to develop it. It's, it's just really hard. Uh, it's usually disease specific. I'm not saying it cannot be done, but for proof of concept, I would start with treatment, you know, with something that we we know works. Hi, That's a great question. So, you know, what I showed, it's kind of indirect evidence, right? We're basically showing is that this has an effect in kids on low dose. We don't know if medium or high dose. So this study that I just mentioned, a STAR, that's what it was designed to uh, do, to, uh, to answer that question. So in essence, we measure stress before a trial of inhaled steroids in, inher in steroid naive uh, kids and young adults, and then we measure afterwards. And we just completed the, the study, so we don't know yet. Uh, if that is the case, that makes sense, right? So, and I think that's where we're going. We're going to more sort of individualized approaches. Um, uh, sure. So, Melissa, I'm going to It's an excellent point, uh, Sharon. And in fact, you know, when you look at the literature for risk factors that have been really proven, uh, very low birth weight is a, is a strong risk factor for childhood asthma, by far. So that uh, in utero smoking are probably the two strongest risk factors, right? So we actually did a study in these uh, Puerto Rican kids when they were of a school age, and those who reported prematurity or those who were premature had a higher risk of asthma, but it was only present in the kids who were also atopic. So this is sort of the two-hit hypothesis that you have heard, right? So in those who had alter immunity and probably abnormal lung development, those were the ones who, did, who had asthma, whereas those who were not atopic, uh, but were premature, didn't have an increased risk. So it's, a, it's an interesting question. Right. So I'm wondering if, if the, the feedback was, you know, we assume it goes in sort of one direction, right? So uh, folks who have these activated amygdalas and these down. What about the reverse? And in treating the asthma, do you see serotonin or dopamine effects? Do you see that going back and feeding the what a great question, Mike, and, and I think that's why we need trials, you know, um, that would be, so, you know, my vision of a trial, we have to be a large trial, and, and hopefully we can do that and get some biomarkers, right? So you would like to see not only improvement in outcomes, but hopefully explore mechanisms. So 
perhaps doing you know functional MRIs, uh, you know looking at uh, markers, got a column in different things, and see what the effect is right when you treat them. That's a very good point. Uh, we haven't, you know, we have adjusted for that. Um, so, you know, we have adjusted for uh, type of health insurance, use of controller medications, you know, taking all of that into account. We haven't, I don't think we have ever done like an interaction, right, which I, is an interesting question. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. I have a question about the methylation mechanism. Whether or not it, in other, in asthma and other diseases, speaking, Treatment for speculative or depression changes or reversal in some of that methylation process, or is that a more so? That is why you know exactly goes back to Mike's question, right? I don't think we have shown that there is data for telomere length. Um, you may be familiar with which is not the same as methylation, but yeah, you know, there was this Lancet paper, uh, where if I remember correctly, this is a large study of adults, and one of them was asked to do exercise three times per week and, you know, consume a healthier diet. There were like three things, and there was a control group that kept doing whatever they were doing, and they were changing telomere length. So theoretically, that is possible. That's why people, you know, are so interested in epigenetics, and mouse work suggests that's possible. I don't think we've shown that in humans yet, you know, to that effect. I have a question from Does resistance distressors change any of these results? Outstanding question. Uh, so, in the last study, <laughs> talking about this at dinner yesterday, we, um, of course, all of the work that I've shown you is in collaboration with a psychologist at the University of Puerto Rico, Glorisa Canino, who's the one who got me into this, by the way, created Glorisa mm -hmm. for this. And so, we started to study resiliency as well. So in the last study, we have data in the STAR, we have data on something called familism, which refers to familial support. We have data on community social support. And in theory, right, those who are at an, an index, index of resiliency at the individual level. So it is true that given the same level of exposure to violence, you do expect inter-individual variation in resiliency. Uh, we haven't, you know, done that yet. But it's a great question. Is, there, is violence a second gift on top of some other underlying cause that might not appear without violence? That is what the data for TH2 immunity suggests, right? Um, and, you know, we are at the beginning of this. So remember, I think I show you in, in those analyses, we did account for things like air pollution. So typically communities where there is high exposure to violence, like the South Bronx, where I did my internship, right? If you take a kid or an adult in the South Bronx, they are exposed to multiple potential risk factors. So think of a kid, you know, in an apartment, in the projects in the Bronx. He cannot go out because of violence. Parents say don't go out. Um, it's inside consuming a diet that is usually not healthy because of lack of access to, you know, fruits, vegetables, food deserts. Uh, it's exposed to allergens, cockroach, dust mite, gains weight, and it's probably also highly stressed. So these things act in conjunction. The problem when you start to think about interactions is you usually need very large sample size. Uh, so you need uh, studies in the millions, you know, if you're going to do that properly. But it's a great point. Yes. Uh, thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, we have some trainees and some house staff and fellows who are interested in following in your footsteps in a successful research career. Any advice to them? Well, you know, um, all I can say is you have to find your passion. You know, um, I think that's the first thing. What is it that you love to, to do? Find something that you love and pursue it with great passion. And then the second thing that is perhaps as important, if not more important, is to persevere, right? So I can tell you I've met, I'm old enough now to have met people who are 100 times more intelligent than I am, 
but you know, because of my background, I'm an immigrant, I'm a minority in my own country. Uh, I don't know. I guess one from my parents, going back to the resiliency, and I've just tough it out, you know, whereas some other people quit. It's just, <laughs> it's just simple. I've seen many people quit, you know, in my years uh, doing this. So. Welcome back, Juan. You were going to tell us. I remember some clinical um, scenarios with you. Um, the generalist in me, so you, thank you, this was a brilliant talk. Um, the generalist in me can't help but end where you're ending with a social determinant. We all have to keep in mind the social determinants, and we have to think about the political season coming up and voting for people who. Uh, care about access to care and the climate because without those things, we're all going to be gone. I completely agree. You know, and that uh, goes back to your question, right? So I think that the way careers evolve. So thinking of my own, right? I started as a clinician. You know, I wanted to be the best clinician I could be. I got great training. And then I moved into research. And then after a while, you have to consolidate yourself. That's the advice I would give the young people. You cannot do this early on. It's just it's hard. But once you, you know, are settled, then advocacy uh, becomes a big part of, of, should become a big part of who you are, at least for some of us. So I do believe, I know, you know, I've gained knowledge on this. Of course I advocate you know, <laughs> for uh, clean air, you know, the things that we all care, environmental justice, access to care, those things are dear to me and would go a long way to address this. So. I have a question as sure. well. So you talked about uh, the, the etiology of chronic disease dying in the womb and break my heart, obviously. So do we know anything about maternal exposure to stress and the risk of that? And have you studied uh, steroid mechanisms? Like uh, 17, because those are related to some expression. What a great, great point. So the person who has been doing most of the work on prenatal stress is Ross Wright, mm -hmm. was a fellow with me at the Channing, and Ross is now at Sinai. You know, she's uh, she's like me, an internist pulmonologist, but she's the vice chair of pediatrics. You know, so <laughs> another person people get very confused about. But, but Ross has done these birth cohort studies, uh, looking at prenatal stress and showing that prenatal stress associated with greater risk of childhood asthma up to age, I think her studies up to age five uh, mm -hmm. with wheeze and everything else. She's also shown some data for um, changes in immune responses with TH2 predominance from prenatal stress uh, and has started to do some methylation in blood, you know, There are some people who are also doing, there is another study out of Pittsburgh uh, where they, they started being interested in prenatal stress and prematurity, going back to, to uh, Sharon's question, and they are collecting placenta uh, DNA. Sure, you know, so um, there are some data uh, correlating with severe asthma exacerbations for sure. You know, where, uh, so repeating the question is where people have looked at stress in relationship to asthma severity, and the answer is yes. You know, so I show you data for lung function, asthma control, quality of life. There are people who have looked at severe asthma exacerbations. That's one of the most highly replicated associations, uh, you know with acute and chronic uh, in relationship to being hospitalized, going to the ED, needing a course of steroids. But that's actually a well-established uh, relationship, more so than even, you know, asthma inception, right, which there may be still some controversy. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody.